Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to The Formation of the Bronx, Part 2. I hope that you enjoyed Part 1. Let's do a little review. In Part 1, we learned about the word diaspora. A diaspora is a massive movement of people from a homeland, and these people get transplanted into a new section of the world, and these people bring their culture from the old world to the new world and tend to live in neighborhoods where there is a culture that is familiar to their mother country, their former country where they moved from. In the last video, I gave the example of Little Yemen, which is a new neighborhood in the Bronx. The other thing that we went over was that there are push and pull factors that greatly influence uh, families or a person's choice to immigrate to a new country. New York grew because of location, location, location. So you have England over here. And if we zoom into this, New York is situated right about here. Remember, the first airplane flight was 1903, so we're talking about people traveling by boat in these days. If it was a great distance, it was by boat, or, if you're talking about land, horse-drawn carriage. And it has natural harbors, and it has access not only for England, uh, for shipping, but pretty much uh, everywhere that had access to the Atlantic Ocean. OMG, Mr. K, like, so what about harbors? Like, big cities can happen anywhere. Well, if you don't like my point about the harbors, why don't you look up how many major cities there are in the middle of deserts? Zero. Drop the mic. So, a city with natural harbors, it's going to be great with trade, because ships can bring goods, they can park there, and trade can happen. And where trade happens... Jobs happen, so people moved there. New York has been shaped by numerous diasporas of people. Now let's go from the years 1600 to 1880 to look at the population growth of New York. When a tree grows, it starts out very slowly, and then it explodes. I don't think you should take that comment literally. I meant the growth explodes. The tree itself does not explode. And that is exactly what happened with New York. On the right-hand side, watch the dates in the upper right-hand corner. And about midway down, you see the urban population. Get ready to watch it explode as we get into the 1800s. Now let's really dive in and prep you for today. Take a look at this quote from the New York Times. By 1860, an extraordinary 69% of voting age New Yorkers were foreign born. Now, keep that in the back of your head and let's watch that population growth again. Look at this boom. Word got out that opportunity was being made fresh daily every day here. Oh, I know. I know you are dying to see how this map ends up. So here's the teaser, but there's a few very important points that you need to understand before processing all of this. Let this process, okay? 1860, 69% of voting age New Yorkers were foreign born. Nativism. Get to know the word. It is a strong hatred of immigrants by people who have lived in the region longer. In America, we vote. Do you think having 69% immigrant population in New York shifted the political power? And other than voting, there was one other major pushback. Jobs. Labor. Think about it. After millions of Irishmen showed up from Ireland after the Irish potato famine, the generation of New Yorkers who lived here before were not happy. The new Irish immigrants cut into the labor force, and that created competition for jobs. An Irish interview. 
Let me tell you, mister, in the 1840s and the 1850s, it was the Irish that were moving to town. The Irish went and had a potato famine. That's right, we did. And we had to move. Our crops were killed. There was nothing to eat, man. So we went and moved to New York. That's right, we did. What do you remember about the potato famine? I'm British, not Irish. Does that make you a nativist? I don't even know what that means. Hopefully after this demonstration my class will, but... And you see political cartoons like this. Let's take a deep look. Oh snap, there's a guy in the cage. And the caption says, The most recently discovered wild beast. But who is the artist talking about? Ooh, Irish American dynamite skunk. Whoa, that might have been an insult in the mid-1800s. Dynamite skunk? But here's the thing. Anyone alive and aware in the 21st century has seen some serious nativism going on. The orange guy. Back when he announced his candidacy, the day he announced his candidacy in 2015, he made inflammatory remarks about Mexican immigrants. They're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. Yeah. Now, do you see why somebody transplanted from another country, they're going to look for their countrymen. They're going to settle around people who have a similar history and background to them. But this fool's not done. Th this is the perfect example of nativism. All right, and of course, he was talking about Haiti. According to the New York Times, he complained that the 15,000 Haitian immigrants who received visas in 2017 all have AIDS. Stay classy. In that very same meeting, the Times reports, he said that once the 40,000 Nigerian immigrants given visas arrived in the U.S., they would never go back to their huts. We'll stop there. Uh, but he has obviously said a heck of a lot more. Whenever you think of Donald Trump, think of the modern example of nativism. And again, nativism is a fear or hatred of immigrants because immigrants in masses, well, that could change the way that people vote. That could change the majority. But this tends to happen when you horrify a lot of people. Oopsies. So back to the Bronx, Bronx of the 1860s, 1870s, Oh, that is still farmland, uh, or as I said in the first part, the boonies. I mean, it's not even registering yet on this map. We have Manhattan, we have uh, Brooklyn starting to grow. But that is going to change really soon, as soon as the subways come in. So you get a fascinating, fascinating era. The 1870s Bronx, or then known as Westchester, is the boonies. And the Manhattan neighborhoods are all different groups. This is going to seem out of the blue, and it is. But do you know what New York's first sanitation department was? Pigs! Early New York smelled like hell. Our sanitation department was the pigs. Now, basically there would be no garbage men or women to clean up after us, take the garbage out, bring it to landfills in various places. No, the garbage would accumulate in the streets. No, I'm not talking about the garbage that uh, garbage trucks come around and collect that are in bags. We're not talking about bags here. And people would depend upon pigs to eat it. And that wasn't all. I want you to Google the term night soil. People lived in tenements at the time, if they lived in Manhattan. Overcrowded places without bathrooms. Mr. K, I think you should use night soil in a sentence. Sure. People would dump their night soil out the window. Like this. Yeah, you might have guessed that COVID-19 was not the first pandemic in the history of New York. It was not. Nowadays, in lower Manhattan, in the areas that it costs you a million dollars to buy a shoebox size of real estate, it was dirty and it was overcrowded. 
That was until the subways came. So this is the end of part two. Get ready for the activity and uh, I hope you enjoyed.